Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Veena, a senior behavioral therapist at Autism Recovery Network. So I've been working at uh, ARN for the past four years now, and I've recently obtained my master's of education in developmental psychology. So today I'm here to uh, conduct this webinar, and I'm going to talk to you about school readiness for your child with autism using the ABA VB techniques. So let's get started. All right, so uh, this is the agenda for today. Uh, so first, I'll be starting off by talking to you about what school readiness skills are. So school readiness skills actually are skills that are needed for your child to be considered school ready. So aside the must have school readiness skills, I'll also be giving some tips to parents on how they can be involved in uh, getting their child ready for school. So next, after that, I'll be giving you some tips on um, how ARN, some, some of ARN's approach to making your child uh, school ready. And also we will be focusing on the academic tasks that are done in the P1 uh, curriculum. And some of their prerequisites will be uh, explained on uh, further on later. Lastly, I'll be ending off this webinar by talking about the essential uh, must-have social interactional skills. We'll continue. So these are some of the misconceptions of school readiness. So when we speak of the misconceptions of school readiness, first one is my child is good with academics, so he's ready for school. So it is to be noted that uh, actually when we speak of school readiness skills, aside academics, there is a large number of skills that actually fall in this category. So it could be a child's own disposition, uh, social skills, basic skills, behavior, language skills. So all of these matter as well. So number two, it says, my child will be ready for primary school no matter what, just like they are siblings. So at this point, I want to uh, make a clarification. So when we speak of school readiness and school adjustment, they are two different things. So when you talk about school readiness, it's a gauge of the necessary skill set that your child has. When we talk about school adjustment, it's a matter of time. So school readiness is actually a gauge of the uh, necessary skills that your child has to equip themselves for school. Number three, my child is able to sit on the chair and is well behaved, so they are ready for school. So again, on-seat behavior is just one aspect of uh, school readiness. So uh, just having that alone is not going to be sufficient. Your child should also have the sufficient attention span and to listen and follow the instructions given both in a one-to-one -one setting as well as in a group setting. Um, next, it says, my child will have greater awareness and will be able to follow in school by observing their peers in school doing so. Yes, to some extent, the exposure the child gets in a school setting may increase your child's awareness levels, right? But then uh, it is to be noted that uh, sometimes children with autism, they may still, they know what is expected of, they may know what is expected of them, but they may not be able to follow through. And that's probably because of the attention the, uh, they, they may not have sufficient attention to uh, actually follow through with the activity uh, given. Um, or it could be that uh, they may not understand what is actually expected of them. So it could be either for either one of these reasons, they may not be able to follow through. And that's why it's very important that your child actually has an external support, either a school shadow within the school or um, it will be also beneficial if your child has a therapy, one-to-one -one therapy session outside of the school setting so as to, so that they can work on the attention skills and other basic skills as well. Next, uh, it is best to enroll my child in school as they will eventually be ready with some guidance from teachers. So uh, for this point, I want to uh, clarify with you to, to let you know that teachers actually have 40 students to take care of, right? So uh, if your child is not ready, do not rush the process. So it's important to also consider the class size when you are considering enrolling your child in school. So these are some of the school readiness skills that I have uh, categorized and uh, they have been written, uh, they have been categorized into the following four uh, categories. So first we have basic skills, we have cognitive skills, we have social emotional skills and physical skills. 
So these skills are actually, of course, written with the assumption that the very basic skills, such as uh, sustained attention, joint attention, fluent and spontaneous responding, and the child's own disposition, especially in terms of their ability to stay calm and composed uh, when presented with, cha uh, with changes in their routines. So if the child is able to do all of these, then they have some of the skills needed to be considered school ready. So what are the other skills that their child needs? So of course, academic skills are really important. So your child should be able to recognize numbers, alphabets, uh, read simple words, and high frequency words. So high frequency words, actually I have bolded this uh, because I will be elaborating on this in the next slide. So I will tell you more about uh, what it means in the next slide. The child should also have good writing, good counting skills, spelling, can answer and ask simple questions, of course. Of course, this is, uh, this is just one aspect. Basic skills are important as well. So as I mentioned earlier, the child being, being flexible in uh, adapting to changes in their schedule is important as well. Listening and following instructions is key. On-seat behavior, of course, it's important as well. Independent and responsible. So what do I mean by that? So if a child is going to school, is your child able to recognize their own bag? Are they able to pack their own bag? Are they responsible for their own belongings? Right. So these are important skills to uh, have for your child in order for them to go to school. The entire aspect of social emotional will be focused on towards the end of the webinar. So I will not be touching much about this right now. And of course, physical skills, good cross motor and fine motor movements, hand eye coordination is important as well. So this I will be uh, explaining in just the next few slides to come. So next, when we talk about the uh, high frequency words, what I mean by this is that um, uh, this is actually talking about the type of words your child will be encountering on a frequent basis. So these would be words such as cut, match, write, color, label, stick also, right? So these are words, basically it's like instructional words that your child might be uh, seeing uh, when they go to school, right? On their worksheets, especially now since the curriculum, the P1 curriculum is extremely diverse. There's a, it might be just a counting exercise as you see in the middle, but the way it is presented, it's presented in a diverse range of ways. So the child needs to be able to adapt to uh, the different instructions given. So of course, when we talk about the high frequency words, these are not words that you start introducing immediately once your child starts learning how to read. So these are words that you introduce later on when your child goes to school with, uh, of course, I'm assuming your child is first able to read the simple CVC words, three letter words, such as cat, dog, son, so on and so forth. And then we go on to four letter words. And then of course, very functional words they need to know, such as the days of the week, the months of the year, the colors, shapes, so if they're able to read all of this, later on then we can introduce instructional words. So next, so in terms of how we can prepare our child for school, uh, I have categorized them according to the area of deficit that your child has. So if, for instance, your child is showing social skills deficit, it will be good if you can arrange play dates with other children in your neighborhood. So it's not just uh, in your neighborhood, it will be even better if you are aware where, uh, which school your child is uh, going to and if you have any friends who are also attending uh, the same school, it will be good if you can arrange play dates with those children. And one thing I want to caution parents is that when we arrange a play date, uh, it should be not. It should not be forced onto the child. So, for instance, if you if you think uh, if as parents you think that the best uh, way to socialize is in the playground, mm -hmm. but your child hates going to the playground, then the play date should not be arranged in the playground. Because generally speaking, children with autism uh, they lack the social motivation to actually socialize. So, it should not be conducted in a place. Uh, wherein the child actually hates going to the place, right? So it should be an activity that is familiar to the child that both children enjoy uh, playing in because we want as much as possible to get the attention of the child 
to keep them motivated to engage uh, in uh, social in socializing with others. So next, we talk about fine motor deficit. So of course, fine motor deficit, uh, we expose the child to the use of different materials. Uh, so we can use pencils, markers, crayons, and so on. But also uh, first, okay, so this fine motor skills, I will be covering more on this when I talk about writing one of the academic tasks uh, later on in the slide. So of course, the best, so for now, I will just let you know that it will be good if you can expose your child to different instruments for them to use. In terms of gross motor movement, so what I want to emphasize here is that, of course, you can practice throwing and catching ball, but how do you actually uh, engage in this activity, right? So when you throw and catch the ball, you make sure the child is first, teach them these kind of skills, wherein you teach the child to look out for your peer, whether the person is actually uh, ready for them, you know, ready and look at the ball and so then you prompt it to throw the ball and the same goes for catching so when the child if the peer is throwing the ball your child has to catch it right so when you so for the child you prompt them to show show out the hands right so as to receive the ball and then we talk about some of the self-help skills so again it's important for your child to dress and undress themselves in preparation for school and use the toilet independently other skills that are important would be learning how to pack their own bag also, uh, functional skills would be knowing what are the materials needed uh, for a particular session, knowing how to pack their bags, right? So these are important skills to teach. And then we go on to talk about language skills. So as parents, extremely important if you can read with your child as often as possible, especially if your child does not have the literacy skills yet, it's okay. But reading is extremely important because if your child learns to love, enjoy books with you, it actually helps in the development of uh, literacy skills later on. So I have been asked previously by parents, so how do I actually read the book to my child, right? So when you read, uh, you don't just read word for word what is written on the book, but rather you tell them the story, what is actually happening in the picture or you can just point out you can ask the child so how do you make it interactive you get the child to point to certain items in the picture in the book or you can ask the child to label the items in the book or for instance you can say can you find the cat can you flip the page so on and so forth so that's how you make sure the child is engaged uh, while you're doing the book reading so then teach them to ask for help. Again, this is something I'll be elaborating on when I talk about the social emotional skills towards the end of the webinar. Academic skills, yes, functional skills, counting money and all that will be useful. Basic skills, playing board games, learning how to engage in turn-taking activities, sharing, waiting, and of course, uh, learning to cope with not winning. So again, this, because it's a social aspect, I will be elaborating more towards the end of this webinar. So next, we talk about ABA VB techniques in school preparation. So parental involvement in preparing your child with autism for school. So it's extremely important uh, that parents are actually kept in the loop and updated on the child's progress in the therapy sessions. So it's not just that the parent comes in and asks the therapist, so how was my child today? So that's not exactly what I mean by communication. Yes, that's an excellent start. But as parents, uh, if you really want to see the progress, please be consistent with uh, consistent and follow up with what is actually being done during the therapy session. Right? So if there is particular drills that your therapist or a specialist is doing with your child, or say, for instance, if you're going to a speech therapist and they are using particular tools uh, to, uh, for your child, and practicing certain sounds, make sure you go home and you do the same with your child in the home space as well. Next, we talk about building your child's behavior momentum. So behavior momentum is actually a ABA VB therapy technique that we use. So it's a strategy that involves uh, making requests that are easy for your child before getting them to make requests that are much more challenging. So why I have put this uh, image of a pendulum here 
is because you can sort of make a comparison to this uh, pendulum. So for instance, the higher you hold up the pendulum, the more momentum with which it's going to uh, hit the other pendulum balls. So similarly, you want as much as possible to uh, make sure your child is as motivated to work for you as possible. So therefore, you start with uh, doing simple tasks with your child. So one example I can give you is that, for instance, if your child is doing homework and uh, he has uh, addition, addition worksheet to do, and it's a two-digit, two-digit addition. So for instance, if a child is being given a 20 plus 40 question, instead of starting with this two-digit, two-digit addition, as parents, please start with a one-digit, one-digit addition with your child. So you can do two one-digit, one-digit addition of, as first two questions before incorporating the slightly more challenging addition question later on. That way you are giving your child as many opportunities for success and you're also uh, making sure your child is motivated to work for you. Next, we talk about the use of mixed VB and VB means verbal behavior. So this again is a AB, ABA VB uh, technique that we use. Uh, it's a terminology that we use in our ABA VB uh, therapy session. So basically it involves giving a diverse range of instructions to the child so that the child is not rigid, right? Because most of the children with autism, they have certain rigidities. So we want to help them by exposing them to a diverse range of instructions so that they become flexible in understanding different instructions that are presented to them. So now I'll be talking about some tips uh, parents can use for them so that their child uh, is much more smoothly assimilated into the school environment. So firstly, it is important for you to create a weekly schedule for your child and stick to it. So we know, again, as I've mentioned previously, we know that children with autism have rigidities and they have difficulty accepting and adjusting to changes in their schedule. So that's why when children with autism are given a particular schedule, it makes it easier for them to follow it because they know what is to come after that. After this particular activity, they know that uh, they have to do this next activity. So they're able to anticipate what is to come and are therefore much better at managing their emotions. Next, we talk about incorporating play as part of their schedule. Why play, why play is important is because it gives them the space to explore their environment and also helps in the development of social and communication skills. Next, we talk about uh, having conversations with your child about school. So when we speak about conversations with your child, it's important to explain to the child the routines that happen in the day. Okay, so for instance, if your child, it's, uh, the, the school hasn't started and you're just enrolling a child into a new school, as parents, what you can do, besides having these conversations, of course, which is crucial, what you can do, you can go down to the school, uh, you can, of course, ask the permission from the school and you can take certain pictures of uh, maybe, say, the canteen, the assembly ground and maybe the classroom. And then you can go home and you can use these as visual cues to prepare your child. So you can tell the child. So first, when the school starts, you have to go for your assembly and thereafter you will be proceeding to your class and then you will have recess and then you will have dismissal. So you can let them know. Uh, that way they will be best prepared for you can. Uh, ensure that they are much more calmer and uh, hopefully they may not have as much meltdowns uh, this way. So that is one thing to take note of. Again, engage in functional skills training with your child. So what do I mean by functional skills training? So this is something I've mentioned briefly earlier. So these are age appropriate skills, functional skills, uh, that your child will be doing in the school uh, setting. So it's not skills. Okay, you can teach, of course, you can teach your child a range of skills, but best to focus on the skills, functional skills that your child will be doing in school rather than focusing on other things that you want them to accomplish. Because of course, always parents, please remember that the behavior, you have to tackle the behavior first before you teach them the academic work. 
Okay, so uh, functional skills would be things like packing his own bag, uh, learning how to use the toilet, requesting to go to the toilet, uh, buying his own food at the canteen, learning how to wait uh, for the change to be given to him, counting the change to see if it's correct and so on and so forth. So these are the skills that you should be targeting first before you go on to teach academic skills like addition, subtraction, reading, writing, and so on. So again, communicate with teachers to check on the changes in school in advance. So for instance, uh, it will be good if you can let your uh, teacher know if there's, uh, sorry, let your child know if there's any changes in the school in advance. So in the sense that, is there any closure to any part of the school, All right? So if there is, immediately let your child know, okay? And instead of just using a verbal cue to uh, let your child know, it will be good if you can use a visual cue as well to let them uh, understand uh, uh, how to, what are the changes and what is the next uh, step that they should be doing. Of course, verbal and visual cues might help, but it will always be best if you can use a social story. So that is my next point. And I will be elaborating more on what a social story is in the next slide by showing you a sample of a social story. So stimulate a similar school environment at home. So especially in, uh, in the days leading up to the start of the school semester, it will be good if you can have a whiteboard, you can have token system. I will, I'll be telling you what a token system is uh, in the next few slides. And you can also have similar lengths of breaks that uh, the school environment has. You can also have similar frequency of breaks as well. Lastly, and most importantly, consistency is key in whatever that you do. Okay. So next, uh, we will be, yeah. So I will be talking to you about this social story. So what exactly is a social story? So social story can be presented in the form of a comic strip or it can be presented in a storybook kind of way. So what it does essentially is it targets the desired behavior of the child. So it's written in a, in the, in a kind of way wherein uh, it uses positive language. It uh, explains to the child what they should be doing rather than what they should not be doing. So it's always positive. And the sentences are kept short so that the child is able to understand. Of course, it's also written in, as you can see, every day I, I go to the recess, I go to recess, right? So it's written in the first person narrative uh, to give the child a sense of ownership. So as we can see from the first row, uh, every day I go to recess, I go to recess after lunch. First, I put on my jacket, then I line up. So from the first line itself, I can tell that this child for whom this social story was written, this child perhaps has difficulty following routines, All right? So that's why it's stated, these are the expected behavior that the child has to do. So not just immediately run for, to the playground, but rather that they have to go to the recess, go, for the, go to the playground only after the lunchtime. And also freedom of choice. As you can see, I can choose to go on the swing, the slide, or the jungle gym. So they're given an option. They're not uh, restricted. They're not forced to go on only one equipment. Sometimes I wait for my turn and I can choose to play with friends or play alone. And of course, as you see, the last line, recess is a great time for exercise and fun. So it always ends on a positive note and uh, it's written for someone perhaps who has difficulty following these routines, right? As I mentioned. So it targets the desired behavior. So what is the child expected to do? That is what is stated in the social story. So next, we go on to talk about ARN's ABA VB techniques in conjunction with school preparation. So first, we talk about the natural environment training. So what exactly is natural environment training? Natural environment training is a method that we use in our ABA VB therapy wherein uh, instead of doing the session in a formal setting, such as school or in therapy setting, the child is now has to generalize his skills into other environments. So it's actually a method that we use uh, for your child to generalize, to see whether the child is able to generalize across different settings. So one good example that I can give you is 
for example, if your child is learning adjectives, say for instance, wet and dry. So in his formal one-to-one -one therapy session, if he has learned, um, say in picture cards or and uh, maybe in worksheets, if they are, if the child is able to learn across both, what wet and dry is, say for instance, they are they have learned. Okay, give me the wet towel. So now the child is able to pick up in picture card and also circle the dry towel. So they are able to do it in worksheets. Then what we would typically do is try to generalize in the home home space, right? So for instance, you can um, you can ask the child at home. Um, the mom can ask the child, right? Okay, can you give me the wet towel? Then the child has to be able to associate, oh, okay, this is wet and this is dry, to be able to touch and feel and learn. So that's why actually uh, certain concepts like wet and dry, uh, light and heavy, these are uh, immediately when we start off, we start off by introducing it in natural environments. So we use natural, naturally occurring items. So we use a wet towel that is presented in the natural environment. Maybe we can use a feather versus a bag of rocks, right? For light and dry, uh, light and heavy. Okay. So that's how we teach at ARN. Uh, and next, uh, when we talk about token system, before that, I just want to share with you uh, some feedback from parents. So parents sometimes actually complain that uh, they are unable to get the child to work for them, right? And uh, that could probably be because uh, they, the parents place a lot of demand on them. So they, the parents say that, okay, you know, my child is not working with me, but how come he's able to work with his therapist? So I think, of course, it's the demands that parents have on their child. So with you, for instance, with the parents, if the child is not even able to sit on the chair, then as I've always been harping on, please first work on the child's behavior. Get them to sit. Don't target the academic tasks immediately. Okay? So work on getting the child to sit on the chair uh, before you uh, start with work. So when I talk about, so how does token system come in here? So how is token system helpful is that because uh, the child, when you have this visual cue, which shows, okay, you know, you have, you have to obtain five stars before you get the reinforcing item. What it does is that the child will be able to see for themselves how far they have come and how many more stars they have to obtain before getting the reinforcing item. So that is why we use the token system, especially for children who are sometimes impatient when it comes to working for the reinforcer. Okay. So this will be ex ex uh, extremely useful uh, for children who depend on this kind of visual cues. And if you have a child who's always constantly uh, wanting to play, right? Then you, you use a visual schedule so that you can tell your child, you know, you have to work for these two activities. You know, you have two more stars to obtain before you get the reinforcing item. One more thing to note is that uh, besides the, okay, so besides using five stars for a happy face, uh, for, yeah, for, sorry, five stars before the child gets the reinforcing item, if your child is just starting out with the use of the token system, it will be good if you can start out by, say, getting the child to work for two stars and then getting the, giving them the reinforcer. So parents also, please don't be rigid. Uh, if your child is not able to work uh, for five stars, you lower down the criteria as well. So next, we talk about praising good behaviors. So what you pay attention to is essentially what your child will end up learning. Okay, so please be mindful to praise your child for the good behaviors and ignore the negative occurring, negatively occurring behaviors. And of course, when I say good behaviors, it shouldn't be just praising good academic behaviors has to be for uh, praising behaviors such as even good sitting or good listening to you or uh, and so on and so forth okay so that because you want your child to feel appreciated and motivated to work for you okay so next how do i teach my child so this is the p1 curriculum and uh, I will be talking to you about the following uh, activities. So for English, I'll be talking about reading comprehension, writing and listening. For mathematics, I'll talk to you about telling time and addition and subtraction. So these are the following activities that I'll be focusing on today. 
So we will be looking at the prerequisite skills for some of the academic tasks. So for reading comprehension, of course, at the, as it is very obvious, um, reading comprehension means your child should be able to read. Your child should also be able to understand what he has read. So uh, when we talk about getting your child to read, you start off by getting the child to read simple words. So uh, CVC words, like I mentioned earlier, three letter words, and then you can slowly progress to four letter words. So reading simple words means, I think we are just testing the sight reading of the child. So how many, what are the words that your child can just read? And then we teach the child. So once we have a gauge of what are the words that the child can read, we then teach them to decode the words. So that means we teach them to sound out uh, the sounds of the, each of the letter of the word and then uh, figure out what word it is. And we, of course, we guide the child in this process. Then the child has to read small groups of words and then read simple sentences before progressing on to filling in the missing words. So there will be, say, a sentence and then there will be a dash and the child has to choose one out of one of the options from the two options. So that is how we start out by uh, getting the child to see. So this is a gauge to see whether the child is not just able to read, but also a gauge to see whether the child understands what he has read. So aside reading, we also need to comprehend what the child has read. So uh, following reading and following simple instructions. So typically how I used to do this activity with one of my high functioning child, is that I will have a jar and in that jar, I'll have many pieces of paper. In each of the pieces of paper, I'll be giving, uh, I'll be writing down one instruction or one, uh, any instruction that I'll write down. So the child, so now there are many pieces of paper, many instructions in the, each of the papers. And then when the child comes to therapy, he, he or she will pick it out and uh, they have to read what is written on the paper and they have to execute it. So for instance, uh, once I wrote, okay, clean up the table and the child has to read and follow. So that is one way you can present this activity. So in terms of comprehending what is being read, the child should also be able to answer who, what, where, when, and why questions. So the WH questions are ex extremely important for your child to know. But of course, if you're just starting out to work on this WH questions, it will be important if you can work, if you can target one WH question at a time so that uh, the child doesn't get confused. So, okay, so next we talk about uh, reading comprehension exercises. So I have categorized them into three different uh, segments. So there's one, two, and three. So what the difference is, is that, um, so of course, when the child starts, he's going to start with very simple sentences, short paragraphs with a visual cue to uh, aid them in understanding the passage. And then slowly we fade off this visual cue in the uh, exercise number two. And lastly, we will retain the visual cue as the length of the passage gets longer. Okay, so next, uh, this is a uh, this is the MOE uh, English language syllabus that I have actually taken uh, from the MOE website. It's a 40 page document. And this is just one of the slides that I'm uh, using uh, to illustrate what is actually required of your child at the primary one level. So first, your child should be able to list sequence of ideas and events. So they should know, uh, should be able to have the knowledge to put together the ideas right, that is happening, that is occurring in the passage. Then they should be able to do some simple comparing and contrasting either between the pictures given in the passage or it could be between characters in the passage given. Next, they should have a certain uh, uh, idea of the gist or the main idea of the main idea and key details of the story. So they should uh, also be able to identify general patterns from more than one source. So for instance, when I talk about identifying the gist or main idea and key details, what I mean is, for instance, if they're reading a passage, say, for instance, it goes something like this. So Mary went to the supermarket, she bought a watermelon and she came home to buy a watermelon juice, right? And in between there are other irrelevant details, how like say for instance, Mary meets Lucy and it was, and it says how it was nice to meet her and all that. 
But the main idea of the point of the story is that she actually Mary went to the supermarket to buy the watermelon. Uh, so that is the main idea, and that is something your child needs to know because it depends. The main idea of the story, of course, it depends on what happens in the end, right? So parents, please prompt your child in looking towards the conclusion because what happens in the conclusion will tell you whether what is actually what is actually important in the story. Identifying general patterns from more than one source. So, for instance, what I what I um, assume from this statement, of course, there are many uh, different interpretations of this, uh, is that say your child is required to uh, compare and contrast between different uh, passages now, right? So, if your child is now reading a passage about a tortoise and a hare, for example, so what happens in the story is that the tortoise wins the race. Right. So the point is that the hare was lazy, it was overconfident, and that's why, and the tortoise is hardworking. And so that's why it still wins the race, even though the tortoise is slow. So this story, actually, if you think about it, it's very similar to the story of the ant and the grasshopper. Right. So wherein the ant is saving up food for winter, whereas the grasshopper is lazy and it's overconfident, it thinks that there will still be time to save up. Or winter, or things that there will still still be uh, food for winter, right? So these kind of generalization, these kind of um, patterns are actually very difficult for your child to form. So making that connection to different stories is something parents have to step up uh, to guide your child in making uh, these um, in making these relations to other stories. So please guide your child as much as possible. So next, we talk about picture sequencing and logical reasoning. So how can we sharpen our logical reasoning skills? So if you want to sharpen your child's logical reasoning skills, we have to start with some picture sequencing. So as I've said, sometimes children with autism, they learn best with visual cues. So that's why we, it's good to introduce these picture sequencing. So of course, we start with a three picture sequence as follows here. Ask the child to arrange and put in order the pictures. So that's the first step. So if you're given three cards, for your, you, give the, uh, you give the child the three cards and ask the child to put in order the sequence of the cards and then get the child to explain to you what is happening in each of these pictures. So of course, if your child in the first trial may not know how to, uh, either may not know how to uh, arrange the pictures or they may not know why it's, they may know how to present it, they may know the order, but they may not know why it's occurring in that following way. So it could be they don't have the words, they don't have the language skills to explain to you. So teach the child and get the child to repeat after you and then keep trying. And eventually they will get it. So after they have mastered the three picture sequence, what comes next? Comes the four picture sequencing. And lastly comes the six picture sequencing. So in terms of prerequisites uh, of, for the picture sequencing, what does the child actually need to know? Your child, it will be good if your child has some uh, chronological events, chronological knowledge of events. So for instance, that breakfast comes first, then comes lunch, and then comes dinner. They should also know that daytime comes first, and then nighttime, sunrise, and then sunset, and also basic emotions such as happy, uh, sad, angry, and also scared. And it will be good if they are able to associate um, uh, certain events. So for instance, in the middle picture where it says Matt wins the race. So it will be good if the child knows that, okay, like ready, steady, and then they have to go, wherein they have to run. So that's why the child is preparing himself to run. So that kind of associations is also useful will be useful if your child uh, is able to make those associations. But if they're not parents, again, please help the child and uh, eventually be consistent, practice, and then eventually they will be able to get the idea of it. So next, I'll be showing you some of the reading and listening comprehension videos uh, uh, that we have done with our children at ARN. So this is the reading comprehension exercise one where there's a visual cue and there's short passage. And let's see how the child works with her therapist. The name of the story is The Cat in the Tree. Okay. 
Can you read it aloud to me? Sally saw a cat up in a tree. Good. She ran to get her mother to help. Her mom got a ladder and lifted the cat out of the tree. Sally was glad that, that she could help the cat. Okay, so the story is about? Sally. Sally and she saw a? Cat. Cat up in the tree and? What did she do to the cat? Did she help the cat? She helped the cat. Yes. Let's look at the questions now. What did Sally see? A cat. Well done. Who, who did she get to help her mother? Yes. Who did she call to help? Her mother. Her mother. And the last question. What did her mom use to use the cat? What? Read again nicely. What did her mom use to eat the cat? A ladder. Okay, so next uh, we have a reading comprehension exercise two. So this, I don't have the video. So I'll just, uh, because of the time constraint. So uh, we will just, I'll just tell you what it is. So this is of course, without the visual cue and it's just along the passage. So next we talk about the ARN, ARN's approach with uh, listening comprehension. So let's see how the child uh, does with a therapist for the listening comprehension. So for this activity, how we prepare our child is by showing these, uh, we use auditory memory cards. So a sample of it is actually given on the right here. And um, so the front side of the card with the visual cue is the one that the child will be actually looking at. And at the back will be the passage and the relevant questions. So the child has to look at the card, whereas uh, look at the picture and the Therapist will be the one uh, reading off the passage and the child then has to answer the questions. Next picture is, okay, take a look. Yes, good job. Lisa's mom baked chocolate cupcakes for her birthday party at school tomorrow. Who baked cupcakes? Mom. Who's mom? Lisa. Lisa's mom. What kind of cupcakes did she bake? Chocolate. Well done. Hands down, hands down. Chocolate cupcakes. Okay, when is the party? The party will be now for school tomorrow. For school tomorrow. That's right. Why did she bake cupcakes? Because her friends want to see it. No, but why? Why? What is the reason to bake? Why did Lisa's mom bake cupcakes? Um, hands down. Because, because... Because it's school tomorrow. Because it's Lisa's birthday. It's Lisa's birthday. Yes. Yeah, so why did the mom bake cupcakes? It's Lisa's birthday. Very nice. Okay. Do you see the picture? Watching cartoon. Watching cartoon. Good reading. Every Saturday, Maria watches her favorite cartoons in the family room while her mother cooks breakfast. Okay. Did you hear me, or should I read it again? I heard you. Well done. Who watches cartoons? Maria. Very good. What does her mother do? Cook breakfast. Nice. Where does she watch TV? In the family room. Awesome. When does she watch her favorite cartoons? Every Saturday. Wow. High five. Well done. So as you can see, the child was much better at responding in the second attempt. So sometimes the child with autism needs some time to warm up. So give them the space to warm up and keep trying. Next picture is... So next we talk about writing. So uh, this shows the prerequisite skills required for writing. So understand that uh, having a nice handwriting and for your child to write legibly is one of the most important um, priorities for some of your some of the parents right so as we can see writing actually your expectation is actually here s9 and s10 which says printing letters and printing numbers so in order for your child to be able to write these are the prerequisite skills that your child needs so start with s1 all the way up to s10 so first the child should be able to mark on paper. That means if your child should be able to scribble on the paper, it does not matter the type of grip that your child is using to scribble. Then we introduce coloring between lines. So this is an important skill that your child uh, 
should now be able to, it will be good if your child can then move on to coloring. Uh, this is important so that your child gains the spatial awareness to color within the specific boundaries that is given. Okay, then we talk about tracing lines and shapes. So always important to note is that uh, it's important that you introduce the straight lined lines and shapes before you move on to introducing tracing of curved lines and shapes. Okay, so typically we will start by getting the child to trace the uh, horizontal line, vertical line, and the two diagonal lines. And for shapes, we will get the child to first uh, trace square and rectangle and as well as triangle before moving on to teaching the child to trace circle, for instance. So of course, once the straight lines and the straight line lines and shapes have been mastered, we can then move on to introducing so tracing of curved lines and tracing of um, circular shapes, right? Like circle and yeah, so on. So then we talk about tracing letters and numbers. The same rule applies. So uh, get your child to trace letters and numbers that are straight lines. So these could be alphabets such as A, E, F, K, and L. And for numbers, it could be one, four, and seven. Of course, after tracing uh, these straight line letters and numbers, we can then introduce curved line letters and numbers. So these could be S, B, um, and also for numbers, it could be like two, eight, and so on. Then we get the child. Okay, one important thing to note before I move on is that always work on, uh, be consistent. So for letters, work on the uppercase letters first before you move on to uh, lowercase letters. So don't introduce both simultaneously. So if your child has mastered the uppercase, all of the uppercase letters, then you move on to lowercase letters. Okay. So then copying of straight lines comes next. So then uh, comes copying of curved lines, copying letters, copying numbers. So if they're able to copy all of the letters and numbers, then we can get the child to print the letters and numbers. So next we talk about addition and subtraction. So this slide shows us some of the prerequisite skills uh, for, these, for these two drills. So first your child should know all the numbers still 100. And why is it 100? It's so that your child knows a reasonable range of numbers before starting to put together the sum of two numbers, right? So the child should be able to recognize after putting the sum of two numbers, the child should be able to recognize the resulting number. If they're not able to do so then that's why you, you, you need to teach the child how to know all the numbers till 100. So when I mention about uh, knowing all the numbers till 100, what I mean is that first, we typically start with getting the child to root count to 100. So you get the child to say one, two, three, all the way until 100. So if your child is able to do that, then we work on also getting the child to receptively identify the number. So this means, for instance, you can have a chart at home uh, one to 100 chart and you can ask the child can you point to 75 and the child should be able to point to you where 75 is so that's what i mean by receptive identification of the number then your child should also be able to label the number so if you ask uh, if you point to a number your child should also should be able to reply you okay this is if you ask your child what number is this and you're pointing to a specific number your child should be able to say oh this is 75 so all of these three things have to be accomplished first. So first, your child should be able to root count. Your child should be receptively able to identify the number. They should also be able to label the number. Then we introduce counting. Okay, counting, and uh, I want to mention that uh, for counting, we can actually start introduce counting after your child knows about 30 numbers. You can introduce it simultaneously. So for counting objects, so first we start, when you talk about counting, we start by introducing counting objects. So your child, so for instance, if you're giving five marbles for the child, then your child has to count and the child has to label how many marbles there are. So there are some instances wherein uh, the child is able to count successfully, but when immediately after if you ask, so how many did you count? Your child is not able to reply you. So you want to avoid that. So please continue to work on this counting. And then, so if in that kind of situation, wherein the, the child is not able to uh, answer, 
when you ask immediately after, you usually, we usually use a visual guide. So we can prompt the child by holding up cards or we can gesture to the child to uh, let the child know how many they have counted out. So after we are successfully able to count objects, we teach them to count out objects from a larger set. So what this means is that say they are given 10 uh, pencils, okay? So now the child has to, so if you ask the child, can you give me two pencils? The child should be able to pick out just two pencils from the set of 10 and hand it over to you. So it, at this point, it, is, it will be good if you can teach the child to tell you that he or she is done. So you can prompt the child to say, I'm done to indicate that he is done. Uh, he is not going to pick out more pencils to give to you. Then we introduce matching number to object. So when we, when we talk about matching number to object, uh, this what, what is actually required is that for this, uh, the child might be given say five marbles again. So the child counts out the five marbles and at the side, we may be having uh, certain numbers. Uh, typically how we do it is that we'll have uh, in pieces of paper. In each paper, there will be one number written. So maybe we'll just lay out three pieces of paper beside the tray with the marbles. And then the child has to pick out the correct piece of paper corresponding to the number that they have counted out and place it on the object. So that is what's meant by matching number to object. Then we introduce the concept of more and less. So this is uh, a rather complex um, uh, skill to teach because now there are two, two skills, right? More and less. So it requires a certain level of, it requires comparison and certain level of um, ability to understand that if one has more then the other has less. So sometimes children with autism may struggle uh, with understanding this and they might be guessing guessing uh, whether it is more or less. So of course, for this, this is one of the activities that's why we do natural environment training as I've mentioned earlier. So how we do that is that we will get, typically we will use, uh, we will get the child to, um, we will be uh, having say certain, uh, say marbles, six marbles in one basket and four marbles in another basket. So we will be modeling it to the child first. So we can change, please change the items also so that your child does not uh, cue in on um, marbles, then it's more, or you know they don't form that kind of association because that is very typical of children with autism. So always change the materials that you're using. So that's one thing I want to caution parents as well. So also change the side on which you place the marbles that have more and uh, the marbles that have less. Okay, we also use different materials. That's also another thing. And so of course, give uh, different, uh, use different materials and keep practicing with the different materials so that they eventually understand the concept of more and less. Model it to them first. And then slowly after maybe five or six rounds of modeling with different instruments, different items, uh, different presentations, then you can start asking, so which basket has more? If they don't know, prompt it, prompt first, and then tell them why, explain to them, and then you can, hopefully they will be able to understand. So next, uh, I just want to mention that it's uh, beneficial if your child knows other alternatives for more and less, such as concepts like bigger, smaller, greater, and so on. So these uh, words are very important when your child is doing word problems, okay? So in word problems, especially in the P1 curriculum now, which is getting more and more diverse and uh, there are many, many different presentations of questions, uh, it is important that your child knows the different ways the questions may be asked and uh, understand different uh, terms as well. Then we start with uh, single digit addition given the visual cues. So we may give say two lollipops and three sweets and they just have to uh, count the um, number of sweets all together and they have to write the answer. After which we proceed with single digit addition without the visual cues. Uh, so for this, typically what I will do, I will get the child to circle the bigger number. So that's why I mentioned it's important that your child understands the concepts of at least small and big, smaller and bigger in comparison, in terms of comparing between items. So this is important to know. This is a prerequisite before you go on to doing single digit addition. 
So for single digit addition, as I was saying, it uh, typically we will get the child circle the bigger number so that uh, the child knows. So this bigger number is the one that they will be keeping in their head and they will show out three in their fingers, right? So six plus three. So three will be on their fingers and they have to count upwards from there. So this is the uh, prerequisite skills for addition and subtraction. So here is a video of uh, our therapist working with a child with autism. Um, and he's doing a worksheet on uh, counting, both with the visual cue and later on faded off without the visual cue. So this is? Two. Two, okay, let's write two. Very good. Two. Next one. Two. Looking, this is? Two, two plus two. two. How many do we have here? Two. Two, and here we have? Two. Let's count all together. One, two, three, four. Very good. So two plus two equals two? Four. Four. Two, That's four. Right. That's right. Good job. Two plus, two plus one, one equals two, three. Next two one. Plus Let's see. Two equals two, four. Good. Next one. Two plus three equals two, five. Two plus four equals two, six. Okay. It's correct. Okay. That's your answer. Six. Two plus five equals two, seven. Very good. Two plus six equals two, eight. Hmm. Two plus seven equals two nine. Good job, buddy. Two plus eight e eight equals two ten. Mm -hmm. Two plus nine equals two eleven. Number blocks eleven. Very good job. Number blocks. Okay, so now we will move on, and uh, now I will be telling you how you can teach time to your child. So the prerequisite skills are as follows. So first, we get the child to we ask the child to uh, recognize the parts of the clock. So when again, when I talk about recognizing the parts of the clock, it's not just labeling the parts of the clock. So it's not just this is the hour hand, this is the minute hand, this is the minute lines, and so on and so forth, or this is the second hand. So it's not just labeling, but also please make sure that you get the child to point to. So if you're asking the child point to me, where's the hour hand? make sure that the child's also able to respond to you. So once both of these are done, you can then teach the child to tell time. So typically we will start by teaching the child to tell time by hour, then comes telling time by half hour, and then we introduce skip counting. So skip counting is introduced, uh, important note here, skip counting is introduced before we introduce um, telling time by quarter hour and telling time by minute. So when we do skip counting, typically we'll get the child to skip count by five so that, uh, because so, as, so that they will understand that the movement from one digit of the clock to the next digit is five, corresponds to five minutes. Okay, and then, so after skip counting, they should be able to tell the time. And um, uh, yeah, so then after that, uh, they should be able to draw the hands of the clock given that they're able to tell the time when the clock is presented and the particular time is given, okay? So they, after, after the child is able to understand what is the time uh, of the clock when it's given with the uh, given, then we introduce the child to drawing hands of the clock. So next we come to the last segment of, this, of today's webinar. We will be talking about the social interactional skills. So these skills are extremely important for your child to know, and we will be guiding you on how, giving you some tips on how you can actually help your child to uh, socialize with others. So here we have the essential social interaction, uh, social skill um, your child should have. So first, uh, your child should have good pretend play, able to share toys with other children. So these two will be emphasized in the next slide able to engage in turn taking activities. So now I will talk to you about this. This is extremely important for your child to do. So, okay, so for instance, if uh, there are two children, they are playing uh, with a particular, they are engaging in say bingo or a particular game and the child with autism doesn't understand the rules of the game, it's still okay and uh, it's still, it, it's not a big concern, okay? But what is even more important for your child to do is that your child is able to uh, devote his attention to the game. In trying to learn the game, they should also be able to um, prompt his friend. So, they, so if they, the child should know when it is his turn and, uh, play, and try to play the game. And also once he's done, the child should know that it's the other peer's turn and they should be able to 
uh, tell the other peer that it is their turn. So at least having that attention and engagement is important, even if the child does not understand the rules, because there are many different games and the rules change with each of the different games, right? So what is more important is that your child knows how to engage with others, have the social appropriate skills, um, to sit and wait for their turn and not be impatient or have a meltdown and so on and so forth. Next, we talk about respecting personal space. So what I want to emphasize here is that actually this skill is extremely important because, uh, and actually it's one of the skills I say would be overlooked by parents, probably because I understand because uh, there are many other skills that your child might have difficulties with, and so perhaps you uh, want to work on those first. So I understand that concern. So how can we teach uh, the child to respect the personal space is by first contriving the uh, situation in such a way to teach the skill for your child. So for instance, if you see that your child is barging into the room without knocking on the door, then we actually, how we teach this is uh, to actually we will get the child to knock on the door, right? So we first model it to the child. So sometimes students with autism, they may not know how to uh, hold their palm up in a fist. So we might physically need to prompt them and then we model it to them. And next session, perhaps we might use a less intrusive prompt by fading off the prompts slowly. So instead of giving a physical prompt and uh, model it for the child, we might just be um, modeling it for the child and getting the child to follow. And then the following week, we might just be using a verbal cue, such as uh, knock on the door and the child has to follow. And then the week after, we might feed off this verbal prompt and we might replace it with an indirect verbal prompt, such as uh, getting the child, such as saying to the child, so what do you have to do? And the child will then have to knock on the door. So that is one skill and that's how we teach it. Of course, we will not be fading off the skills uh, uh, after just one session. It depends on the uh, skill set of your child also. Then um, they should also learn one another uh, uh, aspect of personal space that uh, I'll be emphasizing on would be how they should also learn to keep their hands uh, to themselves. They should not be touching other people's face or climbing onto other people's laps and so on. So this uh, skill is especially important when your child is engaging in some kind of turn-taking activity, right? So if, for instance, they, the child is going for circle time and after the singing of songs and book time, there might be some gross motor activities that your child will be required to engage in. So if, it's, if your child has to then go on to call another peer for, uh, to engage in this gross motor activity, your child should learn how to tap uh, the peer on their shoulder. So this is something we teach as well. Okay, so next we go on to talk about uh, following directions given, knowing their P's and Q's, and good listening skills are also important to have. Uh, communicating effectively and spontaneously with others uh, is extremely important. So typically we, uh, at ARM, we work on getting the child to make the requests for things they want. So once the child is much more spontaneous and consistent with making requests, we teach the child to ask for help in various situations. So for instance, uh, we might give the child a closed lunchbox and then we wait to see how they respond. So sometimes the child with autism might pull your hand to indicate that they want the lunchbox to be open. So this is the time that we contrive the situation for the child, right? So this is the time that we prompt the child and we tell them, to say, help me open, and then we open it for them once they are able to uh, repeat after us. We can also contrive the situation for the child to request for missing items. So we might give the child a worksheet, but no pencil, and then we might hold up the pencil because some, child, some children may not be motivated to work. So if they, if, you, if they don't have the pencil, they may not uh, it doesn't bother them. So to prompt them, you can hold up the pencil and they might, when they reach out for the pencil, you can then say, uh, give me pencil, you know, you can prompt them to say. We also work on other important classroom skills at ARN, such as getting the attention of the child, uh, getting the attention of the teacher. 
So uh, the child has to raise up their hands to um, get the attention of the teacher. So this is something we work on um, during our circle time as well. So next, okay. So here we have the pretend play and encouraging sharing. So as you see here, the basis to teach pretend play is for the child to identify actions. So that means if you ask, can you show me the picture that shows hugging? Then the child should be able to pick up the correct uh, action card that has been laid out for them. That is one way. And another is uh, demonstrating actions using objects. So if there is, for instance, a cake, a cup, and a ball, and you're asking the child, can you show me eating? The child should be able to appropriately demonstrate eating by picking up the cake. And also uh, engage in pretend actions is important. So pretend actions would be things like, can you show me um, swimming? Then the child should show how to swim, right? Or can you show me singing? And then the child should be able to demonstrate. Then we, talk about, we go on to talk about encouraging sharing. For sharing, we work on getting the child to share snacks with others or share toys with others during the play time. Okay, lastly, I just want to end off. So this is one of the final slides. Uh, I just want to end off by saying that socialization skills can actually be learned. And if your child is not learning, uh, then perhaps we need to change the, our method and our strategies and try to help them as much as we can. Okay, over here, I have a video. I uh, understand that most parents actually fear that uh, how their child might be making friends in school or engaging with others. So this is a video that has been put up by ARM to show how we can work together to help your child with ASD make friends. So I'll just play it. Making your friends can be daunting. For children with autism, this can be much more challenging. In this two-part series, we'll be talking about what you can do to help your child with ASD find and maintain friendships. The foundation for being able to socialize is proper speech. This is because it is a prerequisite for a child with ASD to be able to speak before properly socializing. As shown on the screen, these are some of the challenges that your child with ASD might face. which is why it is essential that you boot your child's language skills first. Using picture cards and social stories can allow your child to understand the emotions of others better. Get your child to identify how these characters are feeling based on their facial expressions. What happened here? Broke the yeah. wave. Yes, the waves broke. Okay, now how is he feeling? Sad. Oh yes, he's feeling sad because He's crying. He's crying. By doing so, your child will be able to make inferences and this will help improve their ability to read social cues and communicate better. Pairing your child with another person can help improve socialization skills. There are a few considerations you need to make when pairing children together which are essential to the development of your child's social skills. Before starting the activity, get your child to greet the other person. This will make your child more comfortable and make future interactions easier. Role playing can help teach your child basic interaction skills. You can do this by using verbal prompts and getting your child to introduce themselves to others and sharing their interests. To better understand this, here's an example of a role play exercise. Say hi. Hi. Good. Say hi. Hi. Let's play. Let's play. Good. Yes. What do you say? say okay. Okay. Good. This practice helps the child to get to know the interests of others better and strengthens the bond between the two parties. <laughs> Lastly, cooperative play involves teaching your child how to take turns and play in the same space as their peers. It helps the two kids be continuously aware that they are playing with each other and provides them with the opportunity to interact. Here at Autism Recovery Network, we provide a center-based program which consists of one-to-one -one therapy sessions and group classes where we will teach your child how to greet, request for things, and ask questions. If you have any inquiries, feel free to contact us using the information given on the screen. 
Stay tuned to the second part of this video, where we will give you tips on how you can help your child with ASD and maintain your friendships. See you soon! Okay, so now we come to the Q&A segment. Um, okay, so I have a question uh, here. So it says, how to speed up learning in children with autism? So because autism is uh, a developmental disorder in which uh, children have specific kinds of rigidities, they have certain patterns, they have certain behavioral issues, right? And uh, certain difficulties in uh, socialization, it depends. Honestly, the answer to this, it depends on your child. So the best answer I can give is there is no magic formula. So if you, of course, if your child is on the spectrum, uh, maybe he has social skills, but he's gifted, then of course you can uh, enroll your child in a heuristics class. You can put them in different uh, classes to develop them cognitively. But uh, the best answer that I can give for this is that of course you need to know your child and the area of deficit uh, and as well as their learning styles that they have. So first, always, as I've been mentioning, tackle the child's behavioral issues first before working on their academics. So also important to note, use short and simple and direct um, instructions, language, when you're communicating with your child with autism, because if you're giving uh, multiple step instructions, they may not be able to follow through. So for instance, if you want the child to pick up something from his bag, then first ask the child to bring the bag to you, then ask them to open the bag and then give the book to you. So there is three steps that it involves. So don't say all three all at once. So chances are a child with autism might be confused. Also, as parents, please always, as I've been mentioning, follow up on what is being done in school or in therapy. So it's not just asking um, how was my child or why is my child not improving, right? So it could be that perhaps maybe you have to also practice at home with your child. So it could be for several reasons that he, he or she may not be improving. Of course, improvements take time and it depends on your child as well, whether they want, they are motivated to work with the therapist and with you as well. So another common problem that I see a lot of parents uh, raising up is that uh, the child might be able to spontaneously label a lot of nouns and objects around the house uh, and cards in picture cards as well. But when you ask them what it is, they may not be able to answer you. So the main reason why this is happening is because they don't have the instructional control or they don't, they're not able to say so under instruction, right? So it, what actually is lacking in the child is the compliance. So as parents, if you want to, if you really want your child to, you know, you want to smoothen out the learning curve of your child and you really want your child to do well, make sure that your child is able to uh, follow you. But first, of course, don't place too many demands on them. So start by pairing with your child. So how do you pair with your child? So for instance, if your child is playing, right? So, uh, and even if he's, he may not be playing appropriately, do not try to change the behavior immediately, okay? Give them the space to explore. And for instance, if your child likes to look at the wheels and he's just playing with one car, he's just turning it uh, over and just looking at the wheels, just let him be. But uh, what you can do, you can come in, you can sit beside your child, you can then tell them the parts. You see, this is the wheel and then you can press the horn and so on and so forth. So don't immediately try to uh, correct the behavior of the child. Then the child might not uh, actually want to listen to you thereafter if you're always trying to uh, interfere with their uh, relaxation or their play time. Okay, so if your child is playing with the car, as I've mentioned, just turn it over and then you can get him to look at the different parts of the car. You can press the horn and get him to explore the different parts of the car rather than just uh, looking at the wheels. Or you can also introduce new toys, right? You can make sure you also have uh, sufficient toys at home, uh, such as those wind up toys. So these are important so that your child um, uh, learns to be naturally curious to, you know, so if you press the button, you know, there's be something popping out. So your child, you can actually pair your child with, through this activity. Then 
uh, once your child is able to likes your presence in their uh, while they're playing, then you can slowly introduce, uh, you can slowly try to gain the instructional control by asking them certain questions or make sure these are questions that you're asking that your child already knows the answer to. Okay, because you want to slowly build up the momentum for your child. So that is, uh, and then thereafter, we can use the token system, as I've mentioned, to get the child to do work with you, but slowly uh, introduce each one of these. So even pairing, it might take months or even say eight or six to seven months for your child to be successfully pairing with you. Depends on the child, of course. Okay, so that's all the questions I have uh, today. And I want to thank uh, everyone of you for tuning in. And I think, oh, sorry. Yeah, so this is the contact details that I want to leave you with. So if you have any questions, you want me to answer any of the questions, um, any more questions that you have, you can call ARN. You can also WhatsApp us. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram. So that's all for today. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. See you.